Hello and welcome to The Rabbit Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now compassionate anti-atheist. Welcome to my channel. If you want to learn more how to support the channel and its mission to normalize atheism and deconversion, stay tuned to the end of the video. Today I am reacting to another video by Road Trip to Truth's creator, John Fabrez. I have some interesting final thoughts on this creator as some things interesting seem to be happening on his channel which I want to save to the end. But this is a video, is a short one entitled, You Need to Know These Five Questions. It seems to be a strange title. It's a strange thing, I need to know questions, but not necessarily the answers. Well, let's see what's up in this very short video. Take it away, John. The reason religions are so popular is because they try to answer these five big questions. Two key words so far, popular and try. I'm not going to dispute that religion attempts to answer a lot of big questions. They do that. They are also popular when you look at the world as religion is definitely far more popular than non-religion. But that is no longer a valid reason to believe in any of them. Popularity doesn't determine what is true. What matters is what answers are provided. Uh, do they conform to their reality? as adjudicated by predictive power, but this means that the questions must at least try to get to that point, and religion often seems to beat around the bush on what is real. But let's see if these questions get us a better answers, or if religion remains our first and worst attempts at answering them. How did I get here? Why am I here? How should I live? How should I deal with moral failure? And where am I going when I die? Whether you believe in God or not, everyone, from Aristotle to Ariana Grande, tries to answer these five questions because they're hardwired into our DNA. Are they? I don't know if DNA has a lot to do directly, at least, with these questions, but some of these questions are people, ones that people commonly ask. Although I do think that sometimes the answers to these questions are more personal and individual than religions would like. As religion tends to answer these questions with broad sweeping generalities, I, on the other hand, can see that these questions, as there may be variants to the answers depending on the individual and society in which they're asked, that's why religion is often a poor answer to many questions as it paints broad stroke pictures of all of humanity without addressing the variance between individuals and societies. And much like a computer needs an operating system to run, you and I need answers to these five big questions to run. Do we? I think as humans we are going to run regardless of questions or answers. Also, I can see how the first question might be interesting to answer, but it might not have no bearing on how we run now. But I'm not sure the analogy completely works for, with me, but I'm going to roll with it. I mean, I could make the statement that ref religion feels like an old, outdated operating system to me, like, you know, Windows 95. That is, as we live, we keep upgrading the operating system so that these answers to these questions can be engaged with better approaches to dealing with them. But an OS on a computer isn't about having correct answers, but rather having an efficient way to engage the data and use it. In fact, having the wrong answers or simply ignoring these questions will lead to a jacked up operating system. How so? Existential anxiety, despair, depression, inexplicable angst, and even rage are all repercussions of running sloppy code. Wow, I, I love how you type evolution as the first answer and then all of a sudden all these error messages come up. Way to poison the well there in an effective and short manner. But your whole list of existential anxiety, despair, depression, inexplicable angst and rage, yeah, they're all feelings. Man, truth is truth regardless of how it makes you feel. Evolution is a scientific fact, regardless of how much creationists say it is not. We don't do medicine and biology research based on creationism for good reasons. It doesn't conform to reality, and it certainly never has provided any predictive results that we could use in like medicines, hospitals, pharmacy, anything like that. Evolution does do that, and has libraries of data to back up its claims by contrast. But the main point for me is, yes, the truth can make us uncomfortable, and the answer to these questions can also make us uncomfortable. But our lack of comfort doesn't mean that the operating system is faulty, just that the answers make us feel uncomfortable at times. 
This discomfort doesn't make the answers we get from reason and science false. But I would also be remiss if I didn't point out that this is a typical theist trope to say that atheism slash evolution leaves us without meaning. That's just incredulity and bad understanding talking, not genuine facts about evolution and atheism in action. I would also point out as well that religion often also still leads to rage and angst and depression and anxiety and so on and so forth. I didn't have any better answers when I was in my Christian days to, to these emotions and things that made me uncomfortable than I did without it. Um, although I do think that secularism and getting rid of religion and God altogether gives us better answers as humans. What is this sloppy code? Any incoherent answers to the five big questions. Answers that do not correspond to reality. So you think the problem that we all have as human beings is that we do not have good answers to these questions, and that leads us to incoherent, unreal answers. But if you are always going to assume that these questions have an answer that is the answer, instead of constantly improving and evolving this answer, then religion might very well get you off track as well. In fact, I think it does for that very reason. This leads to the question, which religious system, if any, has a coherent code. Coherent code, yeah, except that's a bigger problem for religion uh, than I think for secularism or a lack of religion. There are so many religions and so many gods to choose from that there is no way it can provide a coherent answer in my opinion. And that is because you assume that each of these questions has the answer that is applicable to everyone. I am not sure that there is one answer that fits all that religion seems to provide to some of these questions. But let's demonstrate by answering these questions. Can I get rid of religion and get better answers? So let's start with the first one. How did I get here? Evolution plus my parents and here I am. I know this isn't an answer that sparks human exceptionalism or hubris about the human race, but it is a humbling one and I think that's far more beneficial. And religions always like to appeal to human ego as part of the sales pitch. But this doesn't really have that as part of its sales pitch. The thing about evolution that makes people feel uncomfortable is it doesn't make them special any more than any other critter on the planet Earth. It doesn't put you into this special role as being the human race and put you up at the top of the food chain anymore. From my perspective, the truth here leads to a great deal of humility rather than the whole created by God theme many religions have. The fact is, evolution is probably true because it's a very poor sales pitch. You know, this is your meaning. You, you're the product of genetics. You're the product of biology. And here you are with the one life you get. What are you going to do with that? Okay, that kind of leaves it at your doorstep. But the one thing you can't gravitate towards is this kind of human exceptionalism where you get to pat yourself on the back simply because you're a human being and exist. The lack of coherence on this issue is more a religious problem than to me. I'm giving you an uncomfortable answer, perhaps, but it's not an incoherent one. It has a lot of data to back it up. It has a lot of things uh, to, to support it. Whereas religious claims about, you know, why are we are here and all the origin stories don't seem to have a lot of evidence for them. And the more you try to provide evidence, the more you run into the other answer. But I can say that by accepting evolution plus my parents, as the answer has been very humbling for me personally, I'm not some special creation of God, and thus I deserve, somehow deserve to oversee everything simply by my existence or being created in his image. I am not special above all the rest of creation. It means that whether or not I have value will be based far more on what I do and have little basis in simply that I exist. My ego has to take a back seat to actually doing something to help people and make this a better world. Not any notion that I'm simply special because God created me. The question of why I am here, um, that's a question whose answer is going to be different for each person. There is in my mind no real universal answer to this question. Getting rid of religion gets rid of the idea of a universal answer for purpose. Religion might say there is one universal purpose for humanity as a whole, but religion doesn't lead us to a universal or coherent answer. They say that such an answer exists, but they never give one. This actually leads to existential angst when the one answer that religion tries to provide doesn't line well up with that specific individual or society. 
I have to provide my own answer to this question, and it means I have to do the work on my own to figure out why I am here. It's a journey of discovery for myself and not some sort of you know, thing that God imparts in, to everybody, which ironically, most people who are religious do as well. You know, They figure out what their purpose is as they journey through life. They just kind of you know, backdoor give credit to God after they figure it out. Most of the time, what I saw in religion as a pastor was people trying to justify what they wanted to do in the first place and then saying after the fact, post hoc, that, oh yeah, God led me to this. This happened a lot. The third question is, how should I live? Now, this seems to be the issue for all of us, and since we're leaving religion, I have found better answers that involve more of humanity and less and less of the tribalism which religious uh, thinking gives us that seeks to benefit a small, more than just a small group and myself. Religion ties you down in how you react to people based on belief. I don't have that problem anymore. But the answer, once again, is varied to the individual, and respect to individual choices need to be granted and respected. Religion forces you to only respect those who agree with you and live life the way that religion says you should live it. Secularism allows for variance in how we live, respect for those individual choices different than my own, and living together without hating each other because we believe differently or have different opinions. As for purpose in life, well, I find it more of a challenge, but much more rewarding because of that. I can also change it when things are not working out without the, all the guilt normally associated with religious belief that I somehow missed God's will. For me, purpose is something in progress and a far more defined as the longer I live. I can also have more than one. How do I deal with moral failure? Well, morality is going to be very different without divine command theory mucking it up. We're going to have to give better answers to the questions that morality poses. I don't know if I have a strict answer of what that means for me personally and what moral failure is is also a very good question. What truly benefits the most people might be a good question. Is something that happens actually harmful to people in society or is that just a myth that religion keeps pushing on us? We don't define behavior we don't like automatically as harmful. You must prove that it's harmful. Is there a victim to the action or does this crime to seem to have no victim at all? But there are also many religions for which atonement for moral failure uh, allows you to basically not take personal responsibility for your actions. I mean, if after all Jesus has forgiven your sins, everybody else has to too. And the whole notion of Christian forgiveness seems to lead to an abusive cycle. I don't have that ability to just drop personal responsibility in secularism anymore. I have to take responsibility for my actions because there's no way to punt them to some scapegoat. Um, I can't scapegoat things. I can't get rid of it. You know, I have to take responsibility for it. Religions often just try to get rid of that personal responsibility and just follow some sort of code as a way of doing that or some religious belief system. I don't have that anymore, and that's actually better because now I take responsibility for my actions when I screw up. Where am I going when I die? Nowhere. In fact, death is the end. And I find this answer you know, more, far more beneficial when you get rid of an afterlife. It gives the one life I know I have far more value. I treat it with far more respect. I treat my body with far more respect. Once you realize that this is all you get and you've got to figure out a way to make the best of it, it means that you take it far more seriously. I don't put things off that I, I should do now till later as much. When we, you know, we have in heaven, we can make up for the time that we lost here on earth. I realize that that's just a myth. I realize that the time to say I love you is now. The time for hugs is now. The time for valuing and enjoying the experiences I'm having as a human being is now. Not looking at them on some sort of replay screen later on in heaven. I don't get an afterlife to fix relationships. I need to do it now. Bearing wishful thinking has tremendous rewards for me in the now because I'm not engaged in wishful thinking and how I order my relationships and my experiences in life. It gives me greater responsibility to be a good human in the now, and that also gives me greater satisfaction and a greater feeling that things are better and I'm doing much more better than I was before. The fact is that getting rid of religion and God and all the other stuff 
has actually benefited me at least personally in the fact that I take a lot more personal responsibility for my actions, for my purpose. It causes me to actually grow up. I think the problem that religion poses and why it diminishes all these answers is it keeps you an infantile, childlike thinking that God is the only one. Your parents are the only one that will give you purpose. Well, now that carries over to God. Only God or the gods or this belief in afterlife can give you a better purpose. And that's still looking at authority, looking at some sort of thing that's larger than ourselves as what gives us purpose and meaning. Now, that can be a part of it. But I prefer if those things are actually real. That's much more helpful. But I also have to take some remarks on this video. Uh, when I went back uh, to Road Tip to Truth this time, I noticed some changes in the channel. Because three months ago, when I was reacting to some of the stuff that he had in his first season, and he was promoting his third season that was upcoming, but then it never, you know, it doesn't seem to have materialized. And this was three months ago when I was, you know, first doing the work on those reaction videos that I did to him before. And now it doesn't seem that that's there. The promotion of a third season just seems to have disappeared. And now it's just, yeah, the second season's out. Here it is. And so a lot of his videos are just stand pat. In fact, this video that I just reacted to, this short one, is two years old. And the interesting thing about it is he doesn't really give his sales pitch for the gospel in it not even at the end. And it makes me wonder if the young man is starting to realize that these simple pat answers that he has had throughout this entire series with all his videos shows that he doesn't know a bunch of things and maybe he needs to correct that before he starts to you know, do some more videos. Hopefully that's the case. I don't know what Road Trip to Truth is about. Uh, when I watched his initial videos before, John seemed to be very much about this is the truth destination that we're, I'm going to try to drag you all down. Maybe he's had some sort of epiphany that he really hasn't taken a journey to truth to figure out if that is the tr truth in the first place. It would be a far better way, uh, way of doing things. In fact, uh, I, when I look at the title, Road Trip to Truth, it's a great title for a channel. It's a great channel moniker, but it has to be something genuine where, you know, you're going down different paths to try to find out which road is the road to truth. And that would make a great channel, but he doesn't do that. He preconceives what truth is already and then tries to force everybody to take that path to that destination. And that's not really all that honest if you're looking for truth. And I always kind of hold out hope for some of these younger apologists that somehow in doing apologetics, much like I did, they will discover that there's not some really good answers here and that the answers are disputed. Sometimes these young people, they just put out, this has got to be the truth. This is the way I, I believe it. It makes most sense to me. And then quickly discover that there's 45 million counters to this. You know, it's like they suddenly realize that there's all these different ways of looking at things. And with religion, Christianity in particular, you can't really engage a lot of that unless you decide that, well, you know, maybe I really need to take a good look at this and actually understand it. It's funny that even in this video, he uses evolution as something that leads to area message. And so maybe his thinking is still along those lines. And having seen his video on evolution, I can tell you one thing about it. It shows a real poor understanding of what evolution is actually saying. Surprise, surprise. But... It doesn't change the fact that I always hold out hope, as I said before, that some of these apologists in their search will discover the falsity of what their faith teaches, that they will discover that the evidence that they think is so ironclad isn't all that ironclad. I do hope. One of the, um, one of the undercurrent purposes of this channel for me personally is that if I can ever take a young person who's thinking about the ministry or thinking about going to become a pastor, if I can just take them aside for five minutes and say, whether or not you end up believing in Christianity is irrelevant at this point, I want you to consider a couple things. Number one, you need to go and find a, you know, a degree or whatever you're going to do in a job that will make you money because I'm going to tell you right now, religion is going to continue to diminish in the Western world and becoming a minister is going to become more and more of a financial liability than an asset. Oh, they'll still be the megachurch preachers that we can all yell about. 
But I know that in the rank and file pastor, the pastor on every street corner of every church in America, they're looking at a, a dwindling congregation week after week. And so you need to think about how you're gonna support yourself in the ministry, especially if you have a family. And two, don't make this ministry decision until you're well after 30 years old, where you've had a good chance to prove it and make sure that it's true. One of the things you're going to run into, and I ran into it when I was in my 20s, is that older people just really don't have a respect for your opinion in the church. They already think they know it all. And so they will often do pushback against new ideas. It's much better easier to get those ideas passed once you hit your 30s as for some magical reason your opinion suddenly becomes more valuable. So whether or not you end up relieving in your religion or end up going into the ministry in the first place, if you take the time to get a good secular degree that'll make you money and you wait a little bit to get into the ministry, like when you're in your 30s, you might have a better perspective on how to approach it at least if nothing else. Now personally I think you'd be better off just staying with a secular job and chucking it, but you know, if you're not going to listen to that, at least you'll listen to a guy who's been in the ministry for 20 years and, you know, had some problems. So I kind of inject, inject that. And I would give the same advice to John. John, I think, if I can give you some advice, I think you jumped the gun on this truth thing. And you need to really establish what truth is. You haven't done that, okay? And your road trip to truth channel could be a great channel if you divorced it from the automatic Christian assumptions. And it's too bad that you decided to go down that road of a Christian assumption because the, the channel title is a great one. And the idea, if you really broaden it out, is actually a great one too. But I think the problem is you've gone down this apologetics line and quickly have discovered that things are problematic which makes me wonder why no more third season is promised and now it's just an affirmation that the second season is out. What changed? I have to wonder. Well, that's it for this one. I'm always interested in what you have to think about these videos in the comments, so comment away. Uh, I appreciate every like, share, and subscribe. You guys are awesome. It's been a really good uh, week uh, in terms of comments. I know the Labor Day holiday probably influenced things, but you know, got some new things coming up on the channel, so stay tuned and you'll see what's happening. Um, but, you know, there's lots of ways to support this channel uh, financially. Uh, my PayPal link is in the description. Always appreciate the direct donations when they're, when they're needed. Um, you know, every view, every share gets me more views, so the ad revenue is there as well. Super chat, super thanks are always available to you, uh, whether it's a live premiere or comments. But the best way to support this channel is membership. Uh, because membership allows me to focus more and more on the videos that you guys love and enjoy without having to worry about the YouTube algorithm as much for income. And so I appreciate every member. I want to give a shout out to all of them. The, there's definitely some growing ranks because of gifted memberships to people. So thank you to those that gifted those memberships from those new members. Uh, many of them stopped by to say thank you and didn't know who to thank. So uh, thank you to all of you that have gifted memberships and uh, to all of you that have become members to them. Uh, welcome aboard. Welcome to being a citizen of the Rabid Nation. And um, and it's the best way to support. So shout out to all my citizens, rabid citizens and tribunes. You guys are what make this channel work. And as always, live your best life. You only get one go around and then it's over. So you want to take all your time, money and opportunities and spend them on yourself, on uh, the people you love and care for and to make this a better world. You'll be happier if you do. And don't waste them on the trappings of religion and faith because that's a dead end. I speak from experience. And as always, thanks for stopping by and I'll catch you next time.